Hello and welcome to Midweek Bible Video. Uh, we're continuing what we've been doing, so we'll do a question, go over a question from the New City Catechism. We'll do a section of Thomas Watson's All Things for Good and talk about it a little bit. And we'll do a Bible study from Philippians 1. Let me pray. Lord God, I pray you bless what I offer today, that it be fert spiritual fertilizer for the oaks of righteousness of your people who, who listen. And I pray that uh, they find many other good resources to take them through this sealing time, that this be a time that seals them in their faith rather than shakes them. Amen. So we're on question 47 of the New City Catechism, uh, with what we did last week. Try to remember it if you can. I'll leave a pause after the question. Does the Lord's Supper add anything to Christ's atoning work? No, Christ died once for all. The Lord's Supper is a covenant meal celebrating Christ's atoning work. It is also a means of strengthening our faith as we look to him and a foretaste of the future feast. But those who take part with unrepentant hearts eat and drink judgment on themselves. And the verse is, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Now, why, why this question? It's addressing a belief that different groups of Christians have held at different times that there are things which add to Christ's atoning work other than Christ dying on the cross. That there are things the Christian does to, to gain that atoning work or add to it um, or just have more of it. So rather than simply accessing the crucifixion, uh, the atonement by faith, you also do something else. Uh, for someone who's really into like high-end holiness movement, for instance, you access saving grace by being holy. Here, this is aiming, obviously, at the Roman Catholic belief that when you partake of the Mass, you gain saving grace. Saving grace is infused into you. Uh, this is medieval metaphysics, so I won't go into that, though it is interesting. But the key difference here is that rather than you go to the Mass and you are given saving grace, you know, your salvation is added to and strengthened by uh, the participation in the Mass, the Lord's Supper does not do that. The Lord's Supper is instead a covenant meal. It strengthens our faith. It's a foretaste of the future feast. Um, it's something which brings us to remember and to enjoy, um, including the spiritual miracle of, of being with each other and with Christ, that Christ died once for all. It does not bring us saving grace. We have it because we have saving grace. And I think what's important there to, to to drill into us to when we go to the supper is a wonderful reminder, not that we need to work for our salvation, but that we have salvation through faith and the works that flow out from that are a seal upon it. The things we participate in, like baptism and the Lord's Supper, are peculiar, special graces of the salvation. They don't add to it. For Watson, I'll read chapter one verses three to four or sections three to four chapter one is the best things work for good to the godly and this is all based on the verse god works all things for good three the mercies of god work for good to the godly the mercies of god humble us then went king david and sat before the lord and said who am i O lord god and what is my father's house that thou hast brought me hitherto that's 2 samuel seven eighteen. Lord, why is such honour conferred upon me that I should be king, that I who followed the sheep should go in and out before thy people? So says a gracious heart, Lord, what am I that it should be better with me than with others? That I should drink of the fruit of the vine, while others drink not only a cup of wormwood, but a cup of blood or suffering to death? What am I that I should have those mercies which others want, who are better than I? Lord, why is it that notwithstanding all my unworthiness, a fresh tide of mercy comes in every day? The mercies of God make a sinner proud, but a saint humble. The mercies of God have a melting influence upon the soul. They dissolve it in love to God. God's judgments make us fear him. His mercies make us love him. How was Saul wrought upon by kindness? David had him at the advantage and might have cut off not only the skirt of his robe, but his head. Yet he spares his life. This kindness melted Saul's heart. Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept 1 Samuel 24 16 such a melting influence has God's mercy it makes the eyes drop with tears of love 
The mercies of God make the heart fruitful. When you lay out more cost upon a field, it bears a better crop. A gracious soul honours the Lord with his substance. He does not do with his mercies, as Israel with their jewels and earrings make a golden calf. But as Solomon did with the money thrown into the treasury, build a temple for the Lord. The golden showers of mercy cause fertility. The mercies of God make his heart thankful. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will make the cup of salvation. I will take the cup of salvation. Psalm 116, 12 and 13. David alludes to the people of Israel who at their peace offerings used to take a cup in their hands and give thanks to God for deliverances. Every mercy is an arms of free grace, and this enlarges the soul in gratitude. A good Christian is not a grave to bury God's mercies, but a temple to sing his praises. If every bird in its kind, as Ambrose says, chirps forth thankfulness to its maker, much more will an ingenuous Christian whose life is enriched and perfumed with mercy. The mercies of God quicken. As they are lodestones to love, so they are whetstones to obedience. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living, Psalm 116.9. He that takes a review of his blessing looks upon himself as a person engaged for God. He argues from the sweetness of mercy to the swiftness of duty. He spends and is spent for Christ. He dedicates himself to God. Among the Romans, when one had been redeemed by another, he was afterward to serve him. So a soul encompassed with mercy is zealously active in God's service. The mercies of God work compassion to others. A Christian is a temporal saviour. He feeds the hungry, clothes the naked and visits the widow and orphan in their distress. Among them he sows the golden seeds of his charity. A good man sheweth favour and lendeth. Psalm 112.5 Charity drops from him freely as myrrh from the tree. Thus to the godly the mercies of heaven of God work for good. They are wings to lift them up to heaven. And spiritual mercies also work for good. The word preached works for good. It is a savour of life. It is a soul transforming word. It assimilates the heart into Christ's likeness. It produces assurance. Our gospel came to you not in word only, but in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. 1 Thessalonians 1 5. It is the chariot of salvation. Prayer works for good. Prayer is the bellows of the affections. It blows up holy desires and ardour of the soul. Prayer has power with God. Command you me, Isaiah 45, 11. It is a key that unlocks the treasury of God's mercy. Prayer keeps the heart open to God and shut to sin. It assuages the intemperate heart and the swellings of lust. It was Luther's counsel to a friend when he perceived a temptation begin to arise to betake himself to prayer. Prayer is the Christian's gun, which he discharges against his enemies. Prayer is the sovereign medicine of the soul. Prayer sanctifies every mercy, 1 Timothy 4, 5. It is the dispeller of sorrow, by venting the grief it eases the heart. When Hannah had prayed, she went away and was no more sad. 1 Samuel 1.18 And if it has these rare effects, then it works for good. The Lord's Supper works for good. It is an emblem of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19.9 And an earnest of that communion we shall have with Christ in glory. It is a feast of fat things. It gives us bread from heaven such as preserves life and prevents death. It has glorious effects in the hearts of the godly. It quickens their affections, strengthens their graces, mortifies their corruptions, revives their hopes and increases their joy. Luther says it is as great a work to comfort a dejected soul as to raise the dead to life. Yet this may and sometimes is done to the souls of the godly in the Blessed Supper. 4. The graces of the spirit work for good. Grace is to the soul as light is to the eye, as health to the body. Grace does to the soul as a virtuous wife to her husband. She will, she will do him good all the days of his her life. Proverbs 31.12 How incomparably useful are the graces. Faith and fear go hand in hand. Faith keeps the heart cheerful. Fear keeps the heart serious. Faith keeps the heart from sinking in despair. While fear keeps it from floating in presumption. All the graces display themselves in their beauty. Hope is the helmet, 1 Thessalonians 5.8. Meekness the ornament, 1 Peter 3.4. Love the bond of perfection, Colossians 3.14. The saints' graces are weapons to defend them, wings to elevate them, jewels to enrich them, spices to perfume them, stars to adorn them, cordials to refresh them. And does not all this, all this work for good? The graces are our evidences for heaven. Is it not good to have our evidences at the hour of death? So 
one point I wanted to bring out, and then I just wanted to repeat a couple of the lines because they're so good. It's telling, connected to our catechism question, the way that Watson talks about the graces of the Spirit. The graces, you know, the uh, things like faith and fear, the hope and meekness and love, they are uh, gifts from God to the believer, to the godly. They are evidences for heaven. Um, they, the Lord's Supper works for good by being an emblem of the marriage supper of the Lamb, being an earnest of the communion we have with Christ in heaven. It is something for the godly. It isn't saving grace to those who need saving grace. Um, it is blessing to those who have saving grace. And that's the difference, isn't it? That's the point we're talking about, uh, that uh, the graces of God to the believer are blessings and encouragements and evidences for heaven, which is a good line. They are evidences for heaven. When we are insecure, we can look at where God has been giving us hope or meekness or love or faith or or fear for him, fear of him. Uh, the other couple of quotes that came to mind, just because four pages of Watson are more worthwhile than most 45 minute uh, megachurch sermons. A good Christian is not a grave to bury God's mercies, but a temple to sing his praises. The Christian is not an inactive recipient in that sense of grace. They don't say, oh, well, thanks. I really enjoyed that. I needed that. They go out. They sing God's praises. They are, they are a temple. Uh, again, they are a temporal saviour, he says. Charity drops from the Christian freely as myrrh from the tree. Because God has filled us up, that overflows into worship of God and into mercy for our neighbour. That struck me. The other is the mercies of God quicken. As mercies are lodestones to love, they guide our love, they are whetstones to obedience, they sharpen our obedience. They are The mercies of God are lodestones to love and whetstones to obedience. If you thought anything was particularly noteworthy, tell me, I'd like to hear. Now, we're going to read the Bible. We're in Philippians chapter 1, continuing our series. You can watch the first two videos on the channel if you didn't already. We'll start at the start of verse 18. We did 18a last week, but we'll start there. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this imprisonment will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honoured in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labour for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart, to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the gospel of Christ, for the faith of the gospel of Christ, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So, so far in this introduction to Paul's letter, We've seen Paul has hinted at some of the topics he intends to cover in his letter. He's discussed the effects of his imprisonment. You know, Paul is in prison in Rome because of his preaching of the gospel. And he wants to get some advice to the Philippians in case they can't see him again. So the next section, 18b to 30, builds on this. It addresses the Christian response to suffering using Paul's situation and it turns that to, toward the Philippians. Uh, he uses his situation to cast light on theirs. He both deals with their present situation and future possibilities. So this week, we're going to try to draw out from this section three things. One, Paul's general doctrine of Christian suffering. Two, 
what situation the Philippians are presently in, and three, what situations they might face or get into. Now the first subsection, verse 18b to 26, is justly famous. It's one of the purple passages of scripture, isn't it? Very famous. It sums up in many ways the Christian attitude to life in this world, in the flesh, uh, and how Christians deal with suffering. And this is what Paul thought about when he was faced with likely death. When he thought, I really might die here, this is what he thought, this is what he wrote down. Most of us are going to be fine in the present crisis, but some of us might not be. And at any rate, having a taste of our own mortality is a very good thing. And this passage is the Christian response to that, to the taste of mortality, to the fear of danger. So let's go through this. Why does Paul talk of rejoicing? He's already rejoiced that the gospel of Christ is preached, even if it's by people who are jealous or lying. Some people are taking advantage of Paul's imprisonment uh, to say, well, Paul's gone. I'm important now. Listen to me. And Paul says, great, as long as they're preaching the gospel, I don't care. But why now? Why is he saying again, I rejoice? Because not only is the gospel being preached more because of his imprisonment, but also everything that's going to be fine for him anyway. How so? Is he confident that he'll be released? He says he's confident. This is verse, uh, well, 19 and, and 20. This will turn out for my deliverance. How? I will not be at all ashamed, but Christ will be honoured in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul expects to be delivered from prison. Yes. But that might be because he dies. The real deliverance is that Christ will be honoured whatever happens in his life or in his death. Paul is going to honour Christ. Real freedom, Paul says, can be found in a prison cell or a locked down house if Christ is honoured in your body. It is not how active you can be or how many things you can do that honours Christ. Uh, it is whatever you do. Do you do it to honour Christ? As John Milton said, they also serve who only stand and wait. And here's that famous verse, verse 21, for, to for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If he lives, he serves Christ. Uh, verse 22, he says his labour for Christ will be fruitful. But if he dies, he gains. And why? Is he looking forward to sweet oblivion? Is that what he's hoping for? By no means. Look, uh, verse 23, he desires to depart and be with Christ. To live is Christ, to die is Christ. They're different modes of Christ but both are Christ for the Christian. If Paul survives he can labour for Christ here, if he dies he can be with Christ in heaven forever and both are good. You know one is better for him, His late, you know he says you know we see uh, he's an old man, he's ready to face judgment, he's been pruned by Christ, he has been purified and tested in the furnace by Christ, he's been winnowed away by Christ. But one is better for the Philippians. They're a church community in need of their spiritual father. They need him to guide them, to prepare them for their future, for their own trials and their future trials. And Paul remarkably chooses their good over his. He knows, you know, he's confident he'll get that good with Christ, but he chooses short term suffering for him or limitation for him to benefit them forever. You know, he then seems to make a choice. As long as he's needed, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. He even expresses some hope that he might see them again. Um, that's verse 26. We don't know if he did, and he certainly qualifies that later in this passage. But he says, I'll stay as long as I'm needed. So he is here summing up the Christian experience of trials in this life. You know, not just trials from persecution but from anything he sums it up like this living is serving christ dying is gaining christ this is apparently rhetorical on paul's part uh, it's offered as a comfort to himself but of course it's comfort to the philippians he's not wasting words he's telling them what they need to hear why do they need to hear it why do they need comfort well paul is absent from them and they are worried about him as far as we can tell from the start of this letter and the second subsection, that's verses 27 to 30, they sum up the situations the Philippians are in or that they might face and therefore need comfort in. You know, Paul has emphasised at various points how well the Philippians are doing. Uh, you know, verses 5 and 6, for instance, and also somewhat verse 25. 
God has begun a good work, he will finish it. Um, there is already, uh, you know, progress and joy in the faith for the continuing, uh, for the Philippians, but he wants to be with them to help them with that. But in verse 27, he says, only, like one qualification, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. He says they're doing well, but to keep working on doing well. And why this emphasis now? So that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul may not see them again. He hopes to. He can't guarantee it. But whilst he's still alive and able to advise them, he wants them to secure their good habits of faith. You know, they're doing well, but they need to work on keeping doing well. Paul doesn't want them to be like children who behave well only when watched. He wants them to be spiritual adults who act responsibly off their own back. You know, he's a good spiritual father. He wants them to come to maturity. It's also interesting to note the particular problem he wants them to avoid in verse 27. This is going to be a theme for him. He doesn't want them to be disunited. It would be bad not to stand firm in the gospel. It would be bad not to strive with one mind for the gospel. Paul is concerned about unity in spirit and in mind, standing firm in one spirit, striving for one gospel in one mind. If you like, he, he wants them to be unified in love and in thought, not contradictory things, two things that are important. He is concerned for his church having unity in spirit and in mind, in love and in thought. And in verse 28, he mentions the second issue, the opponents of the Philippians. And he's going to return to them. And he does make some comment on these opponents of the Philippian church. They're not named at this point. He says it to encourage his beloved spiritual children. So look at verses 29 and 30. For it has been granted to you in relation to these opponents for the sake of Christ. You should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. It's not the prosperity gospel, is it? You know, no one says you should name and claim suffering. Well, Paul says you should name and claim suffering. Christianity is not for Paul just about believing something intellectually. It's not for Paul just about enjoying something emotional. Oh, that was a lovely service, Vicar. It is a participation. Christianity is a participation in the life, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think of Romans 6, where he talks of sharing in Christ's death in baptism. Or 1 Corinthians 10, when he talks of participating in Christ through the Lord's Supper. Christians, Paul says, suffer for Christ. And in this immediate context, as we see in verse 30, he means they suffer because they preach the gospel in the face of opposition. There is a wider content to this idea of Christian suffering. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says his shipwrecks are suffering for Christ. But here, Paul is seeking to encourage the Philippians to see future suffering um, for their faith, for being Christians, as a gift from God. It has been granted to you. As John Piper says, it's like it's wrapped in a box with a bow on top. It's a present, it's a gift. Take it. Paul is raising this here because he expects things to get harder for the, the Philippians. It's not um, a, an empty point. Right now, they do have opponents. Right now, they may need to focus on unity in spirit and mind. But soon things are going to get even harder. And he may not see them again. He may not be able to write to them again. And so he wants to use this discussion of his suffering to show them how to be resigned and peaceful in their suffering. Dying is gain. Suffering is a gift from God for the Christian. You know, the instinctive reaction of every human is to shy away from that. That is not the reaction of the Christian. Death is the handmaiden to heaven of the Christian and suffering is the schoolmaster, the training, the gym of Christians, preparing them for the marathon of faith. So what have we learned from this section? When we put it in connection to what we've already read, we see that Paul is preparing the Philippians for various possibilities. Him visiting them, or him dying in prison, them being persecuted. He also addresses some of the issues they need to focus on, their opponents and their unity. So in future weeks, we need to spot these. We need to look out for these themes. Three themes, how he develops them. One, the opponents of the Philippians. Two, Christian unity. And three, Christian suffering. Those three themes are going to come up again again and again in the letter. So let's pray, or let me pray. Father God, thank you that suffering and death are not curses to the Christian, but gifts. I pray uh, that you endow us with the grace to see that, 
that you endow us with perseverance in this trial where we may feel we are suffering stuck in our homes or or in a difficult situation maybe for some of us even away from our families i pray that you give us uh, forbearance that you you make us see in this you are making us more like you that we resemble you more and more in our isolation or, or in our patience for noisy children or for each other and in in seeing others have to forbear our sin lord i should i pray you you show us more and more of you and i pray lord uh, that you give us a sense of your mercies in this that we are not grave graves for your mercies uh, but temples of praise and temporal saviors for our neighbor that myrrh drips off us uh, as from the tree the myrrh of mercy i pray all that lord in the name of your precious son jesus christ amen well i'll see you next week